Dennis Fro. If you've been involved in an accident, call me and I'll fight for you. I'm not an actor or a celebrity spokesperson. I'm a real trial lawyer and I've appeared before real judges and real juries on behalf of people with serious injuries. So when I say I'll fight for you, I mean it and I'll back it up. If you've been hurt in an automobile or 18-wheeler accident, contact me toll free at 866-529-2444 and I'll fight for your rights. Think about this, uh, Jeff, man. This is the same culture that allowed, how many was it, 120 million blacks to be kidnapped from the West Coast of Africa and brought all the way over to this, right. this new world. Right. And we still here 400, 500, six years later. No help from my brothers and that. This is the same culture. Like what, we, we still have the same disunity. Are in LA. Okay. All right. So here, uh, uh, bro, I was why is say, that bad if it benefits because, them? Because they came together to. Why is that them. bad if it benefits them? The the the. This is what the they're doing it because it benefits yes. them. Because you it says African Americans. Saying? It specifically mentions us because we were getting resource streams after the after the civil rights movements and the money was going to us. They decided to not be white no more. Okay, great. That benefits them. You don't get what I'm trying to say. Why are we mad at them for doing what benefits them? Because that was a move against us. They were like, "Hey, these black Bro, people get okay. money." But why? Why are you mad at them for doing what benefits them? I'm not mad at them for that, but we should do the same thing and on some op shit. There we okay. go. So take the an answer, brother. And you know what that means? That's what I've been saying this whole time. Unity. Don't worry about what they're doing. You focus on unifying yourself. See, all this complaining about the, what the next man is doing that benefits right. him, that's not making it, that's not taking us any steps further. But she's not going to have any access to that 800, uh, 800 million. Now, she probably was getting a million dollars a month from her husband. I can't see how he didn't have a million dollars. Here's a black card, baby. Go do what you do. But so now she's in a situation where, damn, I'm about to lose everything because I had a miscalculation. And that's where they are, the old uh, saying go, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. That's yeah. what other says. So she tried to be a hog and now she's about to get slaughtered. You see what I'm saying, bro? Mm. So, you know, that's unfortunate, but I'm not feeling, I don't feel sorry for Dr. Dre. I feel sorry for the guy that's making $15,000 working at Sam's Club or Walmart who has two kids by a, a woman who has three other kids and he the only one paying child support and his child support goes to paying all these for all these other kids. That's the one I feel sorry for. Well, I've been practicing law going on uh, 21 years now, licensed in Texas, Louisiana, Illinois, New York. I'm also licensed to practice in several federal courts and the United States Supreme Court, along with the Fifth Circuit, U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. I started off uh, at uh, Grambling State University. I went to Southern University for law school, graduated in 2000, uh, took the bar uh, July 2000, scored a perfect score. And then when I went on to Tulane University Law Center, where I got an LLM, an environmental and energy related law. My love has always been tort law, environmental law. Uh, I started off wanting to be a biologist. Well, I started, I wanted to be a veterinarian. Then I kind of said, eh, hey, I don't know about that. Uh, after they had me dissect rats. <laughs> so I'm like, I oh, think yeah. I'm sticking to the lawyer stuff. But either way, you know, I um, I enjoy what I do. I now I practice personal injury law in Texas, mostly Texas and Louisiana. And recently, over since 2017, I've been uh, heavily involved in environmental tort litigation here in Houston. And After a car wreck, you may have to fight with a highly trained insurance company rep whose job is to knock your damaged claim down and out. It's a bad idea to enter the ring alone against a trained boxer, and it could be a bad idea to fight against a big insurance company by yourself. When the bell rings, attorney Dennis Sperling will be there to fight for your rights. If you've been seriously injured in a car wreck, call me, attorney Dennis Sperling, at 866-529-2444. That's 866-529-2444.
Hey, what's up everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App, make sure you contribute to the PayPal, make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions that keep this thing going. Thanks. And uh, we got a lot of stuff going on politically. And uh, the question that I presented today for the brothers here is, um, just be, well, this is my statement, just because Trump has been voted out doesn't mean that the, the show is over. 70 million fervent followers voted for him in 2020, despite knowing all of his shortcomings. Trump is a symptom. He is a reflection of how nearly one half of Americans feel. How does this affect black men? Let's talk about it. And as the opening statement, it was 2021 and beyond, 70 million Trump voters aren't going anywhere. Look, unless you've been living under a rock, you know that um, five people have been shot and killed in Washington, D.C. Uh, as of now, uh, related to the, uh, the uh, protest outside the Capitol building, one of them is this young, Benjamin Phillips. Um, he basically runs a, a, a Trump website, Trump pro Trump website called Trump Aru, where patriots can mobilize against the corrupt communist Marxist scummy Democrats. Here's another one. We just learned avid Trump supporter Kevin Greeson, who regularly posted online about getting his guns and taking the country back, was one of the four people who died in the siege. It was five people who died in the siege of the Capitol. Post from Greeson wishing bad things to happen to Nancy Pelosi and identifying with the Proud Boys were found as well. So here's what I'm saying, fellas. Um, you know, these guys, these people are not going anywhere. Because see, all that's going to happen is once these white folks, you know, nature's going to take this course and 50, 100 years from now, this is going to be predominantly probably a Latino country. You see what I'm saying? You right. gonna still be mad? It's, they it's know not what a really mad doing. thing. I mean, where are they? It's just another group of white they're folks. They're gonna do what it is. It's them. Name. What are you gonna do to benefit you? If, I can't be mad at Ariel or other Hispanics for doing what benefits them, bro. If my if uncle Slam told me this a long time ago, man, when I was a youngster, man, he's a hustler. Anybody who reads my book, he said, he said, man, you never get mad at another man about his own stuff. I can't get mad about it, the Hispanic man for doing what's in his own benefit. Hey, I can't get mad at the white man for doing what, what's in his own benefit. You see what I'm saying? If I'm weak enough that what he does F, Fs me over, that's my own damn fault. I mean, you it was on his sneak. This happened your before I was born, bro. This was your generation, 1980s, the early 80s. It was man, right how old there. are you, bro? How old are you? 36, bro. You 36. I'm 46. Man, we the same age. Yeah, bro. I'm 48. We the same age, Megatron. You a grown man. You're not a baby. You a grown man. We the same age. You understand what I'm saying? We're we're viable and living at the same age, right? Now. It's just as much your responsibility as mine, brother. Life that you have for black men who are, um, you know, being shamed and people harassing them and stuff about you know the wife that they choose, the women they want to date. Well, what's your advice to these brothers? I mean, focus on your purpose. You know, like they need to keep their head down like you did and and focus on their purpose, whatever that may be. You know, I would say also try and get yourself into a situation where, you know, you're free. You know, you have a job that you can work online um, so you so you can optimize your time doing other things or start another business. Mm -hmm. I mean, that should be your focus. You know, the haters are the haters are always going to be there. They're not going to disappear. All right, and you just got to keep focused on your purpose and do you. I mean, we used to have that back in the day, right? Before, um, you know, focus on yourself is just do you, and, and everything else should, uh, you know, iron itself out. Yeah. They didn't do. We won't pick sides. What we won't do is 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 get ourselves involved in these sort of political skirmishes that have been going on between the two factions in this country for hundreds of years. What we need to do is take this opportunity to build our own infrastructure, deal with our own internal issues, and not get baited into Republican and Democratic talking points or conservative or liberal talking points. It really doesn't matter because at the end of the day, they're just trying to figure out who's gonna be in control of these resources 
that the, the, the dominant society has taken from the rest of the world. It has nothing to do with us. And so when I see black folks picking sides, yeah, it's great. I don't care if you voted for Trump. I don't care if you voted for Biden. It doesn't matter to me because at the end of the day, you're still a black person, especially you as black men. You as a black man, you, black man, you need to focus on what you need to do. Make yourself a better person. Make your make make figure out what it is you need to in, to uh, enhance your position in this world right now. That's what you need to do. You don't need to get caught up into what Trump is doing. Oh my God, I can't believe that he needs it. none of your business. Not, not, nothing, nothing. Because as soon as they finish with them, they're gonna go right back to you. Attorney Dennis Sperling. If you've been injured in a car wreck, call me at 713 229 0770. Call my daddy, daughter, daddy. called to participate on a panel to speak to that and Dennis when Dennis time came up he said no I disagree with Lonnie Love this is a very simple issue she is too big to get the kind of men that she want it's that simple real simple real simple and uh, and anybody I mean is anybody willing to tell the emperor that he has no clothes on at this point? <laughs> like who who's going to stand up and just say no it's bam it's because you wait like 350 pounds. That's why you can't get the men that you want. That's why you can't get these top-notch men that you want. You know, and, and, and nobody's willing to, you know, say that, man. And that's just unfortunate. But you know what? Part of being an adult is not being able to get everything you want. That's true. You know? That's true. And unfortunately, a lot of these sisters, man, they feel like they set, they're they settling for a brother that works at, at, at the local uh, Exxon plant that makes $120,000 a year. They think they're settling for a police officer up in New York that makes $180,000 a year. They think they're settling for a brother who's a school teacher or administrator making $80,000 a year. And they mind, in their mind, they all deserve a 50 cent. They all deserve a Barack Obama. They all deserve a, 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 you, a, a you name it, a future. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Right. So, man, and you also brought up Trump. So I'm going to ask the question, the elephant in the room is, why is it? that the recent polls are indicating that 25% of black men are, are are set to vote for Donald Trump. He's a racist. He doesn't like anybody. He's mean. He's foggy. He lies. He got a bunch of side women. He's a bad, bad, bad man, according to some of the uh, cable news outlets. Why is it that black men are voting for Donald Trump or set to vote for Donald Trump, according to the latest polls? or some of the polls to the tune of 25%. Can you please explain that phenomenon? Whereas by, by contrast, black women are still on the democratic side and voting for them in the upper nineties. Can you, by your analysis, can you, can you explain that to the audience? Well, I'm thinking that black men have, are growing more and more frustrated with these left politicians. And they came out in 7% in 2016 for Donald Trump. And the number has increased because when they look at 
the cities that are run by Democrats, a lot of these black men are not seeing any sort of progress that benefits them. So they look at these Democrats and they're saying, I'm not getting what I need, especially working class, everyday black men out here. They're not seeing any sort of tangibles being offered to them by the Democratic Party. So a lot of them left us. And a lot, one of the things that led to a lot of them leaving in 2016 was the fact that we had all of these murders of black men like Eric Garner, like um, Michael Brown, Trayvon Martin, and your Barack Obama's Department of Justice did nothing in any of these cases. So these black men were sitting there hoping that the black president would provide them with justice, but the black president decided to blow off black men and when he blew off black men, those black men decided to go to the other side. And now more and more of these black men are seeing some of these indirect benefits from a Trump presidency because Trump's policies that deal with immigration actually lead to the indirect hiring of black men on jobs. And these black men are seeing that they can get employment, they can get economic footsteps that they couldn't get as related to the Obama presidency. And they're also seeing that the Trump president administration has made a few little inroads here and there as related to trying to get justice for black men in some cases. Now, I'm not saying all cases, but we've seen in the case of, of the cases like George Floyd, we saw some action, I think, as related to that case. Then whereas Barack Obama did nothing, his attorney general in the case of George Zimmerman practically ignored black people and when he ignored black people and he did nothing about George Zimmerman, he basically created Donald Trump. And that's something people don't understand about Barack Obama. It was If it wasn't for his inaction on Trayvon Martin and George Zimmerman, Donald Trump wouldn't be in the White House today. Hey, what's up, everybody? If you appreciate the format and you appreciate what we're doing here, then make sure you contribute to the Cash App. Make sure you contribute to the PayPal. Make sure you donate to the Super Chat. It's only you and your contributions that keep this thing going. Thanks. I will scream and I will holler. Then I'll scream and holler some more, saying absolutely nothing. You have a choice in legal representation. And in making that choice, do you want an attorney with a made-for-TV nickname to represent you and your serious car wreck claim? I will growl, kick, and scream. My name is Dennis Sperling. If you've been involved in a motor vehicle accident, contact me toll free at 866-529-2444. The choice is yours. Hey, if you're enjoying the content here at Dennis Sperling Unfiltered, make sure you support it by like, sharing, and subscribing to the channel. And also, hit that little notification bell in the corner so that you'll get notice of each and every one of our live feeds. There was a time in Black America where men could get together at pool halls and Elk Lodge meetings and Mason meetings and church functions even. And... And, and black men could just sit sit around and talk and have conversations and exchange ideas, opinions about relationships, politics, family, work. And uh, that's no longer available to us. You know, even now when we um, get together at family functions, it seems like it's always a, um, you know, women around and even in situations where men are sitting around having conversations we have to watch what we say because we're constantly being policed by women and it's almost as though the women are set upon us to keep us from talking about anything too serious it's 
talk about anything that could actually benefit us, any opinions that may be um, counterproductive to their perspective. It's almost as if, you know, our sisters, black women, treat it like, you know, when we get together, something dangerous is going to happen. And the truth is, that's what happens. When men get together and they begin to speak and they begin to exchange ideas, when they begin to discuss their opinions, what happens is other men recognize that they have developed those same opinions, albeit from different experiences. And so we begin to compare notes. And once men begin to compare notes, we begin to come up with strategies and we can come up with the decisions collectively as to how we'll deal with those sort of situations when they come about again. And because you have more than just one man exchanging ideas, uh, it turns into something like a united front or a movement. So in a situation where you have black women who are 80% um, of which have children out of wedlock and the vast majority of them have children by the same men, meaning that because of the statistics uh, that bear out the fact that uh, these women are choosing to sleep with the same, and they have allowed themselves to be impregnated by the same 20 some odd percent group of men. 41% of black men don't have children. Uh, there's another um, 31 or 32 percent of black men that are married to the women and live with their their wives and their children, which leaves only about 27, 28 percent of black men who are married who are not married with children. Which and then you got 80 percent of black men black women unmarried, which lets you know that 80% are having children by that same 27, 28% of men. And so I always knew that I was a responsible father. That's what I plan to be. And there's so many other black men that say the same thing. And then on top of that, you got that 2015 CDC report that says black men are the most involved fathers in America. So it doesn't bear out that we're not good fathers. It doesn't bear out that we're deadbeat dads on mass. What they're referring to is that same 28%, 27, 28% of black men that those 80% of women choose to deal with. Those are the men that are the problem. And even among those men, According to the CDC's 2015, December 2015 study, they are the most active and involved fathers in, in, in their children's lives of all men of all races in the United States. So that means that this problem that black women say they're suffering from is actually greatly overblown. Or other races of women who have even more issues with their children's fathers being involved in their lives are relatively quiet, unjustly, because that means that they would be going through more than what black women are going through, which means that black women, even though they have it the best out of all the women who have children out of wedlock, they're screaming the loudest. That's what that report says with those statistics. And when you say something like that, openly and you defend black men openly then you're considered the bad guy and so that's what i've been doing for the past four or five years i think tamir rice and trayvon martin um and the fact that in 2014 i was held up in front of my law office and forced to sit down on the curb by police officers uh, it really, really made me recognize that I had to become an advocate on behalf of black men. For those of you who don't know the story, I was walking out of my building and um, on a Friday afternoon, I was headed to the ATM machine, which was right downstairs. 
As I turn my back to insert my card and get my money, two police officers from the Houston Police Department pulled up behind me. They had their guns drawn and they said, put your hands up. Now, I was armed at the time with my pistol. It was dark outside and um, I didn't, they didn't announce themselves as police officers, which means that they could have been anybody. And had I reacted by reaching for my pistol, I would have been dead right now. I would have been shot down in front of my law office at the ATM machine. And there's nothing that anybody would have done about it. They would have, the police would have said to be justified in shooting me. And uh, I'll be dead in the street. And this was right after Ed Gar Edward, brother uh, Garner had just gotten choked out in New York on TV, Every, where everybody can see it was recorded. And so I, it, it caused me great pause. And it forced me to recognize that uh, there's no escape for black men. Now, of course, you know, they didn't charge me. They took my pistol. They sat me down on the curb. People were walking by. They realized that they had made a horrible mistake, and especially after they found out I was an attorney, something I did not announce until well into the time period. I was sitting on the curb for about 20 minutes, and they sorted it out. Um, but either way, I had, uh, I had to endure that. And I know that had I tried to um, resist, had I fought thinking somebody was trying to attack me, I would have been dead right now. Just another dead black man at the hands of the police. It wouldn't matter that I was a lawyer. It wouldn't matter that I was a father. I was just, I would just be dead. Um, and unfortunately, that's the situation of so many other black men. We don't have any advocates. We don't have anybody that specifically says, you know what, I'm going all out for black men and boys. That's going to be who I speak up on behalf of. That's who I'm going to defend openly and publicly. And and when you do that, people consider you to be the bad guy. I have three black sons and I'm a black man. Me defending black men and black boys is, uh, it, it's easy to figure out why I would do that. It's uh, self-preservation. My hope <clears throat> is that after I do this, and I'm doing it not just on social media, but I'm one of the sponsors of the um, Black Male Summit. One of the major sponsors of the Black Male Summit, sponsor, uh, hosted or put on by Brother Derek Muhammad in Houston, Texas. I've uh, supported many little football teams and basketball teams. You know, because that gives little black boys something else to do. And of course, I do my very best to be the best father that I can be. I've literally taken myself out of the country so that my boys and I can spend this summer together here where we are in our uh, villa here in the islands. And uh, because this gives them time to be with their dad. So they can never say, hey, we didn't have time with our dad. I maximize that time I spend with them because it makes no sense for me as a black man to try to save all the rest of the black children, black boys especially, and then my own go to waste. So, you know, I don't want to ever neglect them. And even when I'm in Houston, even when I'm home in the States, I spend as much time with my sons as I can on those weekends when I do get them. But you know, it's unfortunate that I get so much pushback from black women because you ladies would be the primary beneficiary from strong, healthy, positive, assertive black men who will speak up for themselves. Because it, until they begin to speak up for themselves against you, they won't speak up for themselves against the system of white supremacy, racism. They won't speak up for themselves in the university setting, in the high school settings, in the, in the elementary school settings. They'll continue to be victims. And what 
I'm teaching my brothers is how to speak up for themselves, how to use facts and logic and reason to advocate on behalf of themselves so people can't, so they don't get emotional and start saying F you and forget you and the next thing you know they're shot dead because somebody felt threatened. This is what I'm doing as an advocate. Not only am I speaking up on behalf of them, I'm showing them how to defend themselves in public, in public discourse, because the pen is mightier than the sword. And the word that comes from your mouth is the most powerful weapon that you have. And so I'm teaching my brothers how to speak for themselves with all my years of legal education and legal advocacy on behalf of people uh, who I represent in the different courts throughout the United States. I'm using that skill set to speak up on behalf of my brother so that they can then take what I say and use it at the water cooler. So they can use it at their homes. So they can use it at their university. So they can use it at the city council meetings, at the uh, school board meetings, at the football games, at the uh, presidential debates when they are questioning politicians. So they can use these words when they're dealing with the police officers, when they're dealing with the, when, when they're dealing with each other, showing them how to speak to each other with respect and using logic and teaching them how to sway their brothers to the side of justice and righteousness without cursing each other out, without fighting each other. You don't hear me calling my brothers out their name on my page. You don't hear me talking bad about black men on my page as a black man talking bad to another. I tried that. I used to do that early on. I used to try to beat people up on my page. And all I did was make people angry and create more animosity. That is what we were taught. That's how we were taught to treat each other. But that's not the way I'm doing it. I'm reteaching my brothers how to speak to each other with respect with love because at the end of the day brothers aside from a few sisters that are on our side relatively speaking we are on our own it's just us now you may have some allies in other communities but for the most part it's just black men and those few black women that are down with us and that see the fact that without strong black men, there is no black community. Without black men speaking up and advocating and being strong and being bold, and there is no black community. It's, there's nothing. It's just a bunch of women and children and, 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 and weak black men who don't know how to stand up and speak up on behalf of themselves. There's nothing. Kind of like what we have right now. So forgive me, ladies, if you are offended. But as I recall, in the 80s and the 90s and the 70s, you women said, where are all the strong black men at? Where they at? Where are all the educated, strong black men who are good fathers at? Where are they? And then when I show up and all these many other black men that you see on my page, when they show up, and when we say, hey, this form is designated so brothers can speak to each other freely and exchange ideas and share our opinions so that we can come up with a collective plan for how we deal with it. The minute we come up with something that doesn't conform with what you want us to do, then you call us out our names. You say we woman bashing because we tell you, hey, we don't like this bad behavior that you exhibit. You call us gay because you say we go too hard for our brothers. We defend them too hard. Well, that's what an advocate is. I have my advocate, you have your advocate. You think I want my advocate defending you? No. My advocate is here to defend me. That's what you do in courtroom. How would you feel if you were sitting in court and your lawyer began defending the other person? That's not what an advocate does. And ladies, you all have plenty of advocates, especially black women. You got black girl magic, 
the Oprah Winfrey, <laughs> Megan Merkel. You got all of them. You got all the advocates, ladies. What name? What name a black name any celebrity, actor, politician, a, a sports figure, a prominent professional that advocates on behalf of black men in this war against, uh, in black boys against this war against black males. It specifically focuses on, uh, on black men. You can't name one, not one, not one of the 330 million people in the United States, name one around the world other than me that will say, you know what? I'm going to speak up on behalf of my black brothers. I'm gonna speak up on behalf of black fathers. I'm gonna speak up behalf of the lowliest of black men. And I'm not gonna let you talk bad about them in public without getting challenged for what you say. Name one religious leader that speaks up on behalf of black men. Not Farrakhan, not Marcus Garvey, not Malcolm X, not none of them did it. None of them do it. Name one, name one preacher. Not, Cref, not Creflo Dollar, not that one from Dallas up there, the big one, T.D. Jakes, none of them advocate on behalf of black men. Now they'll say we advocate on behalf of black people, but what that really translates to is we're advocating on behalf of black women. And if it comes between uh, being fair to black men and being fair to black women, well, we always gonna be fair to black women. So what that means is that our needs are always subservient to the needs of black women. Because when you say black people, what you really mean is black women in this country, in the United States, actually, not this country. <laughs> in this country, it's, it's unity because everybody has a place. So nobody's fighting for somebody else's position. So they all fit in like a puzzle. You can't have unity when somebody is fighting for somebody else's space. And the United States is back, is backwards. You got the women fighting for power and, and wanting to put the men in a subservient position. So that's why we are what we are. And I know you ladies do not like some of the things and ideas and experiences that I shared on my page. But you're not supposed to like it. Just like if we were privy to some of the conversations that you ladies have on ladies night out or that you have at your sorority meetings or that you have at your ladies church functions, there'll be a lot of things we wouldn't like that you would say. Those conversations about how you treat your husbands and your boyfriends, those conversations about how you go about getting child support from your man, how you go about tricking these men into doing the things that you want them to do. Some of the things that you've done in the past when you wanted to be with this man and that man wanted you over there and you kind of wanted to be with that man over there. We wouldn't want to hear that. But I tell you, at least me and my brothers on this page are bold enough to say what we have to say in public unabashedly. So that makes us brave and that forces us to speak the truth. And I promise you, when you are brave and you speak the truth, God is with you. And that's why I don't get some secret Facebook channel, some secret room where nobody can see. I want you to see what black men are, are talking about. I want you to hear what my brothers are saying and what's on their minds. That's boldness. See, the truth don't have to hide. Lies have to hide behind closed doors. But when you are bold and you speak the truth, God is on your side. And I truly believe that I'm doing the Lord's work. Now y'all may think I'm foolish. And I know that I've lost many friends and many clients, potential clients, because I speak up on behalf of black men. And that does not mean I agree with everything that my brother says. That doesn't mean I agree with all the things that the black man has done to the black woman and, the, and, the, and, and some of the habits and behaviors that black men exhibit. It, it, some of it is just horrible. And that's why I don't call myself pro-black. Because if I did that, I would be limiting myself to saying I'm an av If you just take the literal sense of that word, pro-black means you are always down with black folks no matter what they do 
under all circumstances. And I just can't do that because I'm a child of the most high God. And I was before I came to this earth, passing through my black parents. I was a child of God. So that means I'm a child of justice and I'm an advocate of justice. And I put, and I want justice on this earth, not pro blackness on this earth, because we don't want to replace a white oppressor with a black oppressor. We had that before. And then the white folks came and took over and the Arabs and, and we don't want to replace that. What we want is justice on this earth. Justice for all people. So that's why I don't say I'm pro-black. But back to my main point. You brothers and sisters on my page, recognize that I use this page so that black men can speak freely. I have three or four other pages. If there's some other stuff you later... I got three or four of them. I've invited many of you to come join those pages. This is the only page, this only Facebook page that I have designated for black men to speak freely without fear of being shamed or guilted for what they say. And I know that I've helped many brothers because they inbox me all the time and they tell me just how much they appreciate what I'm saying. And I don't mind doing it. It, it warms my heart to do it. I can do this because there's a fire in me to do it because as a black father and, a, and, and as a black man myself, I know, I know that I would be much better off than I am now. And I'm pretty damn good by most standards, but I would be much better off th than I am right now. Had I had somebody like me or a group of somebodies like me, speaking to me when I was young, telling me things like, Hey man, don't rush out and get married. Take your time, get your education, travel the world, wait till you mature enough, 35, 40 years old, and then reach back and get yourself a, a young wife. Because at that point, you'll be ready to deal with the pressures of being a husband, the pressures of being a provider, the pressures of being a father, and you'll have something you can pass down. A 20 year old boy, a black boy, he doesn't know enough about the world. He doesn't know enough about the world to even be a, you don't even come into your own uh, manhood until you get 35. And you really don't have any goddamn sense till you get about 40 as a man. You, you don't even start making money till you get in your late thirties. And this is after the education, real money. You, you don't, you haven't even stepped up to the plate of manhood. Your hormones are still raging till you 35. You don't even have good sense. So why are you ladies? Well, I know why these ladies do it. The ladies put you young boys, they get you locked down with these babies early, you barely out your mama's house, and they get you bound down and locked down with these babies, and, and then by the time you look up, you're 25, 30, 40 years old, and the child is 18, you've had to struggle and, and, and suffer, and instead of spending those resources on yourself, building yourself up, building your education up, building your business, establishing your household, getting yourself ready for the wife that you were supposed to have. You've been paying bills for some woman who, who caught you when you was weak and young and manipulated you and got a baby up at you. And now you have the man that you should be. This is what I'm telling you brothers. This is why I tell my brothers, don't get married early, travel the world, uh, educate yourself, be the best black man you can be. But see, a lot of people don't understand that. This is not a quick fix. It took us 250 some odd years to get here. Over the past 50 years, we've had the onset of feminism. We're not gonna get out of it in a, uh, in a couple of years. This is gonna take generations of strong black men standing up, getting married, having relationships, and producing strong, healthy children based on their wisdom and their experience that they pass down to those children. See, sisters, you had an opportunity to be in charge. And that's gone on for the past 40 or 50 years. And look at the black community now. Look at it. Look at the poverty rate. Look at the, uh, if you go up to Chicago, I promise you, if you open up those doors in those neighborhoods, it's just a bunch of black women in there and grandmas and aunties raising children. There's no men, no strong men. And the men that you see around there, they're not, they're not strong men. You got a few good brothers in Chicago, like the rest of these cities, but most of these black men are broken. The brothers like myself, who've educated themselves, 
and moved on and are strong enough, we're few and far between. And most of us, I'm honest with you, most of us don't want to have nothing to do with you. Which is why many of my friends thought I lost my goddamn mind back in 2013, 14, when I really just started advocating on behalf of black men and speaking up. Dennis, why do you even bother speaking? You don't have to, you've made it, so to speak. But I've not made it if my people haven't made it. I haven't made it if black men haven't made it. Yeah, I might be okay to be safe, but what about my sons that are still gonna be operating in the United States, driving down those same streets, going that, that uh, Trayvon Martin was walking down? You know, going to those same parks that Tamir Rice was uh, 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 shot in, that, that Mr. Garner was choked out in, Rodney King was beat up on. So if my sons haven't, if my sons have the potential of being taken out, just like I was almost taken out in 2014 by the Houston Police Department by mistake, I haven't made it. So I can't even rest on that. And that's why I advocate on behalf of black men. That's why I don't quit on you all. That's why I speak up. That's why as an attorney licensed in multiple states, having great respect, I would literally pimp myself out and take away from the integrity that people hold in high regard. See, your lawyers treat you bad. They make you wait outside in the hallway just because they want you to know that, uh, and they charge you for their time because they want you to know that their time is more important than yours. But what I do is the adverse of that. I come on here and let you know, hey, I'm an attorney. I have these degrees. I, I'm so-called made it, but I'm accessible to you because I'm a black man first on this earth. I'm a child of God first, but I'm a black man first also on this earth and in this time. And this is my calling. So I'm speaking to my brothers and I want my brothers to be able to speak freely. I don't want them to be afraid that somebody's gonna shame them or say they woman bashing or call them gay or say they must be bitter or their hearts broken. Let me tell you something for you all who don't know. The system that we live in in the United States especially is enough to break any brother down and make them bitter. So those of us who you see still walking around and, and, and still advocating, we are strong black men. Even the ones with their pants hanging down. Hell, even the ones with the goddamn uh, 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 rainbow uh, uh, T-shirts and stuff on. Because they still survive and they just tried to find a way to survive. God bless them. So I'm not angry at any of my brothers. But what I'm telling you is you ladies are going to have to back up and give us our opportunity to speak. Because the only thing keeping most of these brothers from zoning out and walking away from society is me saying, hey man, you can come over here and speak. Come over here and talk to me, man. Would you rather have your brothers happy and healthy with somebody else, ladies? Somebody, another woman from another culture, maybe she black, maybe she a different color. Would you rather have them happy and healthy and raising happy and healthy children in the United States that won't be running up on you with a pistol in 20 years? That won't be running up in your house? They won't be knocking up your daughters and getting them pregnant, leave you. Would you rather them stay there with you in that toxic mess that we call black America or go off and find themselves and, then, and, and become real men and find themselves good women and bring them back and make those children the next generation and the next generation, the next, next generation of children. You have to make a decision because see sisters, you had your chance to be the boss of the black community. You are the most educated, according to the, the statistics. You are the most educated people, so you are the leaders. You make more money than black men, so you are the leaders. You're the backbone of the black community. Isn't that what you say? Well, you are the leaders then. And you've done that for the last 45 years, and you have failed miserably. So now it's time to do something else. So as the leader, you have to make that sacrifice. You have to understand, you know what? I might not have a husband. But my, my niece will, or my daughter will, or my granddaughter will, and she'll have a good one because there are people out there like Dennis Sperling telling these young boys to go out, become men, learn who you are, educate yourself, and then come back if you want to. Or if not, 
speak life into your brothers so that they can then take your place and become better men. This is all I'm asking my brothers to do. And you ladies have a problem with it because it goes against your self-interest. That's unfortunate. But we're going to keep doing what we're doing on my page. No matter what y'all say, we're going to keep on doing it. I'm one of them hard-headed black men. See, I'm one of them ones that's going to stand right in the middle of you and tell you I don't give a goddamn what you say. We're going to keep on doing what we're doing because it's the right thing to do, and that's what God wants us to do. And y'all can take it, or you can let it alone. And I say that with all love and all respect. So, brothers, we're going to continue doing what we're doing on this page. You sisters who, who uh, can get something from this page, please continue doing so. You're welcome to speak. I just ask you not to be disrespectful. But in conversations where you clearly see black men are speaking to each other, don't be the woman that just comes in just to raise hell. Don't be the woman that just comes in to agitate because that lets me know you come from the enemy. That means you're the enemy's advocate in this war against black men, in this war against black boys. You're on the other side. Now, this is social media, so I'm gonna just block you, but I am telling you that's what you are. God bless you all, have a wonderful day. You brothers, I appreciate you, and you sisters who, especially you sisters who, Kimberly, Kimberly, and, um, you know, all you sisters, Stephanie and uh, Robinson and all you sisters that have been um, constantly allowing us to speak. Uh, Nicole, um, so many of them to name. Uh, I appreciate you all for understanding. And there's another sister. I forget the doc. She's a doctor. I forget my sister's name. My God, I'm going to kick myself in the butt for that. But you know who I'm talking about, sister. So I appreciate you all understanding what I'm trying to do. That's that African maternal mother instinct. You see, you want your sons to stand up and be strong. You want to be proud of your son. So you, your so you sisters continue, you, you continue doing what you're doing. You continue sitting back and allowing us to speak and allow us to build and allowing us to grow and become strong. I appreciate y'all. You black women, that, that you're the type of black women that this new black America is going to be built on thoughtful, wise women who don't allow their emotions or their own self-interest to get in the way of their own people's well-being. You're the black women that we need more of, not these ratchet, hoochie mama, selfish, narcissistic women who are only concerned about themselves and the next handbag that they can pick up from the next simp that they've tricked or fooled into feeling, like, uh, feeling emotional and special. You see, we need more women like you all that put substance before... Uh, before fluff you see that's what we need and it don't matter uh how much money you make or how how much uh education you have if you're a good woman we know who you are and we appreciate you sisters we appreciate you black women you're the black women that's gonna be the teachers of the next generation you see these suckers and these fools and these clowns that uh they got big booties thin waists and big breasts and ain't good enough for nothing but laying on their back we don't need no more of them. See, we need queens now. And I ain't talking about Q-U-E-N-S's. I'm not talking about, uh, I'm talking about queens. And if queens are few and far between, you don't need a bunch of them. You need one or two of them to rule the land. That's what we need. We don't need all these thoughts and hood rats and, 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 and skanks and, and women with no self-control and just nothing but Jezebel spirit running all through them. We don't need that. We need good, strong women like my grandmother and those women of those generations from past who sacrifice and cause the men to want to sacrifice. Those are the type of women we need. But either way, I love you all. God bless you. And I hope um, you all take this message in the spirit that it was intended. And that's in the spirit of unity and strength. Uh, it don't matter to me whether you got one drop of black blood in you or no drops of black blood in you, goddammit. If you down with black men, and I'll give you could be white as goddamn a, 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 a snowflake in, in, in Norway. If you down with my brothers in, in this war, I'm down with you. So shout out to all my Latin brothers, 
Hispanic, white folk, anybody is down with my brothers. We need all the help we can get. If you're down with justice, I'm down with you. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. The only time black men are allowed to speak is when it benefits others. So, hey, this is your opportunity to speak. I want to hear from you. And if you want to make this voice louder and clearer, then what you need to do is contribute to the Cash App, to PayPal, and the Super Chat. I appreciate you.